All right, let's look at chapter 3, verse 1. Sardis, here we go, Sardis. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, so write, so notice God is speaking to John to write to the angel, or a.k.a. representation, representative of the church in Sardis. Remember that? I taught you about that concerning angels last time. They mean representatives or representations or appearances. But let's keep reading. What is John supposed to write to this representation? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. All right, remember Revelation chapter 1? Jesus is that person who holds the seven spirits of God within him. And the seven stars. He also holds the seven stars. Remember that? I know thy works that thou hast a name. So Jesus knows the works of this church in Sardis, that they do have a name, San Jose Bible Baptist Church, KJV only, dispensationalism, that thou livest. Yeah, by that name, it's alive. You put that name with, that, with the word of God, man. King James Bible, dispensational, Bible-believing truth, it's alive. So you're alive by the name, but what? And art dead, but you're dead. So there's a church that's only alive by its name. So you know what the bad thing would be? The bad thing is, is that people would know this ministry by name, Dr. Gene Kim, but, it's a, but he's a dead person by his spiritual life. And that when they walk inside this church, they see a dead church. And whenever a newcomer comes in and then doesn't come back again, sometimes you have to inspect yourself and say, I wonder if I was the one at fault because I produced a dead church. And they only knew us living by name only, not by our actual existence. That would put you under conviction. So we put this at a timeline. So Dr. Uckman puts this on Sardis from 1000 to 1500. Larkin, he will put this from 1500 to 1700. Now notice how these both, uh, these both timelines could work for a spiritual application to the church. So during that timeline, if we're going to uh, include the Protestant Reformation over here, that would make a lot of sense for Sardis because by that timeline, they had a name that was alive, Protestant Reformation, Protestant. When Martin Luther nailed his thesis on the church doorstep, that was a name that became alive. There were names that were alive that time. But you know what? If you look at their actions, they were a dead church, to be honest. You know why? Because Calvinism was rooting up that same time. And Calvinism that time, they believed that, you know, God will get the people saved. It's not man's free choice. So because of that, there's no need of action in their part, no need of evangelism in their part to do missions. So guess who was doing missions during that timeline? The Jesuits. They wanted to have the whole world underneath the religion of the Vatican. So they spread out their Jesuit missionaries all over the world, while Protestants, shamefully, during that time, they were dead. They are all just stuck at home. Stuck at home, stuffing their nose in books. They had a name that was alive, but it was dead by action. To be quite honest, it wasn't until the beginning of the 1700s, see? Philadelphia, then you got Moravian missions, and then you also have Great Awakening Revival preaching, and then modern day missions through William Carey and Adoniram Judson spreading out. See, so this timeline would be accurate. This timeline would also be accurate because from 1000 to 1500, despite of, if we include Wycliffe, Huss, and these people coming out, they had their names, Hussites after John Huss, Lollards from John Wycliffe, and all, uh, all these other people, Tyndale. But during that time, there was not much evangelism work. It was, con it was completely dead that time. Everyone was just running for the hills, protecting their own life, stuffing their nose in books, and then, you know, they were trying to preserve the word of God, but they weren't thinking about getting all, all souls saved out there, like us today, see? So it was a dead movement. And 1500 would be accurate as the ending date for Ruckman because 
If we're going to put this at Philadelphia, 1500 to 1900, it would be accurate to say that the Protestant Reformation that time, it was growing, so to speak. So that's the fire. Even though they were like dead Calvinists, you got to be honest, there were millions of Protestants who came out. So that's a fire that's growing, see. So both timelines could work. Both timelines could work, depending how you want to apply that spiritually. Because remember, this is all a spiritual application to the spiritual church. Okay, so let's keep reading right here. So they only have names that are alive, but they're dead in action. Be watchful. They're not watching, see. They're not keeping tabs. That's why there were a lot of doctrinal errors during that timeline. They were exposing the errors of the Catholic Church system that time, but they had a lot of problems themselves that they weren't watchful about. They even, Protestants even persecuted the Baptists. Didn't you know that? What they were called that time was Anabaptist. See, they weren't really good. Luther one time shamefully said, we got to burn all the synagogues of the Jews. He was anti semite be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. They have to strengthen what they had remaining. See, remember like Thyatira, they, all they had was their last stand, their final stand, their last works. That's all they had. And God wanted them to strengthen what they had left over. That are what? Ready to die. It's about to die out. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Their works aren't perfect. Only a name that's alive. That's the only good thing about them at verse 1. A name that's alive. But their works are dead. And both timelines is applicable. Because that timeline, uh, they were getting so dead that it was doomed to uh, go out. It was doomed to go out. Probably the Protestant Reformation would be the exception, you could say. But all the other followers, they were just getting scattered because the Catholic Church that time were just ra uh, rounding up people, killing them like flies. So a lot of them were, so a lot of these people you hear about today, they're extinct. Cathari, Bogomiles, Hussites, Lollards, etc. They're not here today, see? So only their last work was what kept them going, but it was about to die out. I mean, if you give it like centuries, it's not going to last forever. That's why God's Bible-believing truth had to move to different people, see? Different people. Because one group of people shamefully could not continue it. And that's something you Christians better learn. You Christians should learn this, is that one thing I learned from history is that not one group of people continue on forever. You know why? Because of the next generation who messes it up. You don't want to be that next generation. So they're about to die. Okay, verse 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. They are supposed to remember the word of God that they received and they heard from, but they're not applying it. See, that's why the Bible says, be doers, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You're hearing, but you're not doing. And hold fast and repent. So God wants you to hold fast what you have, see? Holding fast, holding fast. Repent, you gotta get right with God. People don't repent. You got to realize what's going on in your life if anything's dead in you and get that right with God. If therefore thou shalt not watch, if you don't watch, see, if you're not looking out on Satan's workings and Jesus is coming and what's going on around you, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Okay, meaning that Jesus Christ, when he comes down for them, he's going to do it like a thief because when a thief comes in, you don't expect when someone breaks into, uh, breaks into your house, right? They have to do it sneakily without you expecting it. Jesus, when he comes down and raptures, that's what he's going to do, like a thief. And you're not going to even know what hour he came on, uh, what hour he came. So meaning this is that this application is going to be applicable to the tribulation, verse 3. That's what you're going to see. So the doctrinal application is to tribulation here. Because Christians... The Bible says whether we're alive or we're dead, and this church in Sardis was dead a lot spiritually, the Bible says that we will be raptured together with Jesus Christ. Now, I know that it would be referring to literal death at 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, but to be quite honest, 1 Thessalonians 4 told you if anyone believed in Jesus Christ, you'll be raptured up to heaven. See, it doesn't matter if your work is dead or you're alive. 
It don't matter. You're raptured up with, to heaven with Jesus, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But Revelation 3 is a conditional rapture, a conditional rapture that you have to work or you're going to miss out. Here are two passages. Look at Revelation 16. You're telling me there are two raptures, Pastor. Amen. That's dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, what you don't know about, friend, is that there are two raptures. So I already have this chart that just blocked everything right here. So uh, I'll just put one right here. I don't know if this is seeable. But if we're going to put half and half right here, here's the church age. And this one is the tribulation in the tribulation, there's one rapture before. That's us. The tribulation, they have their rapture too. See that? That's how it works. That's how it works. How do you know the church is raptured before the tribulation? It's explained at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that there are different raptures. One is before the tribulation, and the other one is conditional at a rapture. Look at Revelation 16. Notice verse 15. Now notice this is well underway at the tribulation, because we're at Revelation 16 here. This is already deep into the tribulation. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Notice right here, God is telling them, see, watch, I'm coming like a thief. His rapture. Let's look at Matthew. Matthew. We'll look at chapter 25. Chapter 25. Notice these virgins were not watching. Have you ever heard of the parable of the ten virgins? You're going to find out five were left behind at the rapture and five accompanied at the rapture. But this whole chapter is a tribulation timeline. How do you know that, Pastor? Because Matthew 24, which is right before Matthew 25, Jesus says tribulation all over at Matthew 24. And he did not stop. He's continuing talking in Matthew 25. So this is a tribulation application. Let's look at Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So that's the Holy Spirit. He's represented as oil. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. See, the coming of Jesus. There's his rapture. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Notice verse 8, the foolish didn't do it. Verse 9, the wise won't give the foolish their lamp, their oil. Verse 10, the foolish went to buy oil for their lamp, but it's too late. Notice, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the what? Door was shut. So these saints went up to the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus Christ up in heaven, while these other five were left behind. Notice how God says this at verse 13. Watch therefore. See, that's why he tells them to watch. For ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. See, they don't know when he's going to come. They don't know when Jesus is going to come at the tribulation. That's why he told them to watch. Or that's why it's a conditional rapture where they have to work hard for Jesus because if they don't work hard, then at their least, where they least expect it, suddenly he'll come down and rapture those saints at the tribulation. Let's look at Revelation chapter 3 again. Revelation chapter 3. And then I'm going to close it off right here at verse 3. The final thing I want to say is this, is that, so here's the thing, is that, there's a thing that I want to teach one day. I just never did it because I'm just so busy. I'm always, always busy. But I wanted to do a teaching concerning about rapture dates or the timing of the rapture, which would have been intensely interesting. But I never did that. But there are two things I want to say concerning about the timing of the rapture. One, we do not believe in setting up in a specific date that Jesus Christ will come at such and such a date and time, and this is 100% true. 
We don't believe in doing that because Harold Camping was very infamous on that. They had billboards over here, and he, he was at Oakland that time or Alameda that time. And I was studying at Berkeley that time, and one of uh, Harold Camping's followers was passing out th these stupid flyers that the rapture was going to happen at May something, and then he was still there at October, you know, because they postponed it to October after that. So it was ridiculous. So we don't believe in that. But we do believe in this. We do believe that the Bible says that you can know an approximate timetable how close the rapture will be. So why? Because the Bible mentioned it, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which we won't turn to for time's sake, it's likened to a pregnant woman, see? So if you look at 1 Thessalonians 5, and then you also look at Jeremiah and other places, it talks about the tribulation being a time period as a woman in pain, being pregnant. So if you're going to take a common sense example of a pregnant woman, you know, you can find out an approximate timetable, right? When the baby is going to be born, but you can't say for certain it's going to be at this exact day, at this exact hour, right? So you're always alert. That's the same thing with the rapture. So the rapture, you can know an approximate timetable, but you can't really say that it's at this day, at this hour. That's why the Bible says you know the times and seasons, 1 Thessalonians 5, but you see in the Bible it says you don't know the day or hour. See that? So you know the timing and the season of it, but you don't know an exact day and an exact hour for it. So here's one of the verses you can use at Revelation 3.3. 3. If people insist that you can't know the timing of the rapture, then why does Revelation 3.3 3 show that it shows right here, if you were watching, then you would have known what hour, you would have known when he would have been coming at an approximate timetable. I mean, look at Revelation 3.3. 3. See, if you're the one that's not watching, then that's why you don't know when he's coming for you. But if you are always watching and alert, then you would know when he would be coming. That's why there's a thing you hear, uh, it's been popularized online about being rapture watchers or watchers of the rapture, meaning that, see, we're always on the lookout when he's coming. Because if you look around you, if you're really watching, you do know this, he's coming any moment. Amen. I mean, there's so many things happening that's crazy. And then when you look at the Bible where it says that this generation shall not pass, they will see the coming of Jesus ever since the restoration of the nation of Israel, Matthew 24, that means we're not too far. Amen. See, it's any time. So I've heard some people approximating the date to 2033. So that's been a common thing among Bible believers. A lot of people were big on 2018. Me, I didn't care, you know. I mean, uh, uh, I had some of the members mentioning to me about the rapture date, and I was like, oh, I hope it happens, you know. I hope it happens. And now they eventually start to follow along with me. I hope it happens after that. <laughs> so because... You're just sick and tired of what you watch online. This is the date. This is the date. And they're always wrong, you know. Amen. When God wanted you to watch for the rapture, he didn't want you to watch where you look like a fool to the people and you're a false prophet. That's right. All right. When you're watching for the rapture, it's, hey, you can see it's happening any moment. You see all these things happening. So you better get saved in Jesus Christ. And doesn't this motivate me more to get out to soul winning, come to church and serve God? All right, let's finish Thyatira next week and talk about Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the golden age of the church. So we'll talk about that one.